Hi, I'm Sarah Lam from Total Health Conferencing, and we're here for part two of colorectal cancer in the time of COVID-19, but this time really to do a deeper dive into one of the products that we learned about during the colorectal town hall. We had an overwhelming amount of uh, questions regarding how people could learn more about a test uh, that really focuses on surveilling your cancer, uh, especially during COVID-19 when there are limitations in the way you can visit your normal uh, clinical practice. So we decided that what we would do, rather than just continue to answer all of those emails one-on-one, -on -one, that we would come back with a specific webinar bringing the experts from the town hall and just do a deeper dive. Especially also since ASCO is right around the corner and there'll be really great data presented uh, that helps strengthen the information around Signaterra. What we wanted to do was bring it to you directly so that you can have this type of conversation with each other, with physicians, uh, with the greater community, and we feel that it's really going to be something that strengthens especially surveillance in uh, colorectal cancer. So I'm joined here today, um, thankfully, with uh, three of the experts that joined us on the Colorectal Town Hall. We're here with Dr. Greg Bada um, and Dr. Manju George and Dr. Alex Alishan, each who will have a different perspective on Signaterra, one on the data and development, one on clinical practice, and then one on how this would impact patients in the community. So I'd like to say thank you to all three of you for joining me today. Uh, and I'd like actually to get right into it. So Dr. Allison, if you would share your screen and just give us a little bit of background on Signaterra so that we could frame out the conversation as we move into the Ask the Experts section. Great. Thanks, Sarah, for that introduction. Um, hopefully everyone's staying safe and healthy during these turbulent times. Um, in the next 15 minutes, I really wanted to review some of the data behind the Signaterra assay. What uh, validation studies have been uh, done to date, uh, what the data looks like from those validation studies, and how best uh, this test can be applied uh, to help monitor patients uh, with early stage colorectal cancer. So when we think about MRD testing, uh, what we're talking about is uh, testing for minimal residual disease. And this cell is actually looking for small pieces of tumor DNA in the circulation, which really are representative of possibly having tumor left in the body uh, after a procedure, for example, surgery. CTDNA analysis um, can be used for many different purposes uh, beyond just MRD testing, uh, including early detection of cancer, thus, for example, improving on things like colonoscopies, and also to better select therapy, uh, frequently in patients with advanced or metastatic disease. Uh, that's, for example, finding a BRAF mutation to be able to describe a specific BRAF inhibitor. Um, but really the focus of Signaterra is uh, monitoring. So it's really understanding CTDNA status, for example, after surgery or uh, during surveillance. So we could get a better insight if somebody's disease has been fully treated and uh, get an early sense if the disease is coming back. So how does the actual assay work? How is it really different from many other CTDNA assays on the market? Uh, well, really the way it works is it's a tumor informed or personalized assay. And really this is the first of its kind uh, for a, a clinical test um, uh, to be tumor informed. What this means is that instead of doing a liquid biopsy on the plasma, we actually first start by sequencing the patient's tumor. And we use that to identify all of the mutations, all of the somatic mutations that are present in that patient's tumor, and then really identify the most clonal mutations or mutations that occurred very early in that tumor's evolution, which are really great biomarkers uh, for if that tumor is present or not present in the body. After we identify those mutations, we actually create a personalized or bespoke assay, which really looks for those mutations which are unique to that patient's tumor in their plasma. Uh, to assess if their cancer is gone or if it's still present somewhere in their body. So why 
you know, why this approach? Well, the, the reason for this is that these clonal mutations occur very early in the tumor's evolution. And if you look for those, you can really get a good sense of the tumor's present or not. And these mutations are really fixed. Once they've occurred, they're not going to, for example, go away. And because of that, they're really reliable biomarkers uh, to be able to track a patient's uh, tumor status over time. So why, why has this type of approach been very difficult uh, to really um, uh, be able to get out to patients until very recently? Well, the reason for this is threefold. Uh, the first is that just the level of tumor DNA in the blood is exceedingly low in patients with early stage tumors. Um, for example, compared to patients with heavily metastatic disease, we frequently need to look for tumor concentrations that are 100 or even 1,000 fold lower in the presence of early stage disease, uh, 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 as opposed to patients with later stage disease. So really we need a very different approach to be able to achieve sensitivities uh, to detect such low levels of tumor DNA. Furthermore, the heterogeneity of mutations uh, makes uh, detecting tumor DNA sometimes difficult, especially in early stage uh, disease. It's hard to know if the mutation you're detecting is from the tumor, or it could be from another source, uh, for example, from a pre-malignant colon polyp. And really, we need to be able to accurately say that the tumor we're finding is from the tumor because the implications of detecting ctDNA, as we'll discuss later, are really huge, um, very important in early stage disease. And then lastly, the high background noise. It turns out that when you start looking for tumor DNA at such low levels, there's just a lot of noise that's present. And being able to rid a test of all of this noise to give very accurate results is difficult and really is best accomplished in our experience with a personalized tumor-informed approach. So we've done considerable validation studies um, in patients with colorectal cancer. So this is a study that's been published in JAMA Oncology, one of the premier oncological journals, uh, where we actually looked at over uh, 700 uh, plasma samples or blood samples to identify the presence or absence of tumor DNA in patients with early stage colorectal cancer and correlate the presence or absence of tumor DNA with patients' outcomes. What we found in the study was twofold. Uh, the first is that patients who had tumor DNA detected in their blood after surgery were at exceedingly high risk of recurrence. So patients uh, in the study who finished definitive therapy which means either surgery or surgery plus adjuvant chemotherapy, who still has tumor DNA detected in their circulation, had upwards of 97% risk of recurrence without additional therapy. So really what this suggests is that tumor DNA is identifying uh, this micrometastatic disease or these little traces of tumor that are left over after surgery that eventually lead to recurrence unless treated. Furthermore, we showed in the study that patients who receive additional therapy who have tumor DNA detected, for example, adjuvant chemotherapy, have actually a reduced risk of recurrence. It's not zero, but we really show that patients who are CTD positive, if they receive additional therapy, can mitigate or decrease their risk of recurrence. On the flip side, patients who were CTDNA negative in the study from just a single time point had a markedly reduced risk of recurrence compared to average uh, risks for patients with stage two and three colorectal cancer. Here, that number was just 12%. Furthermore, because this test can be repeated, uh, you can do this test serially, patients who stayed negative on serial testing had even a lower risk of recurrence, just 3%. So really, we're able to identify patients who are not just high risk of recurrence with Segmentarium, but also patients who are very low risk of recurrence. And obviously, that's really important to know for patients um, when they're discussing treatment options with their oncologist. Furthermore, when we think about traditional risk factors for recurrence, uh, for example, the size of the tumor, uh, the presence of tumor in lymph nodes, uh, so-called TNM staging, um, and compare that to identifying ctDNA with Segmentera after surgery, we are really able to show that um, ctDNA presence or absence is really the only significant risk factor for patient's disease coming back or not. And that makes a lot of sense uh, clinically. If we think about all of these traditional risk factors we use, for example, having a bigger tumor versus a smaller tumor, having a tumor that looks more aggressive as the tumor grade, 
all of these are helping us basically identify patients at high risk for having these little tumor deposits or micrometastatic disease left after surgery, which eventually causes recurrence. But really, I think the powerful statement here is that with Sigma Terra, for the first time, you don't have to estimate if somebody has micrometastatic disease. We're really able to actually just measure and tell a patient, do they have micrometastatic disease or are they markedly lower risk of having micrometastatic disease? So after patients finish surgery and actually enter what's called the surveillance setting, we're trying to identify any presence of recurrence earlier, we also are able to show that Sigma-Terra uh, positivity, so patients who became CDPKA positive, um, were at exceptionally high risk of recurrence. Here, every patient who became CDPKA positive in the surveillance period went on to recur, while patients who stayed CDPKA negative were unlikely to recur. Uh, very few of those actually recurred. And again, I think this is very powerful uh, because it really helps stratify patients um, as either likely having disease come back or not. I think as many of you may be familiar with, um, and maybe some of you have had instances of this occurring, uh, there are traditional uh, biomarkers for surveillance like CEA and imaging, which can sometimes be difficult to interpret. You know, CEA can be elevated, for example, because not of cancer reasons, but for example, in patients with uh, liver dysfunction or because they may be on a different medication, uh, which may make uh, an elevated CA level difficult to interpret. Furthermore, in imaging, frequently uh, folks find what are called incidental lomas, which are, for example, little spots, which are hard to, to distinguish between either the tumor recurrence or, for example, um, inflammation. So Sigma Terra is, is really helpful because of its really high positive predictive value uh, to really uh, be able to identify patients where the disease is truly coming back versus patients who are unlikely to have disease recurrence. And in the study, when we actually looked in the surveillance setting, we were able to show that CTDA could be detected up to 8.7 months earlier on average than clinical or radiological recurrence. And in some patients, this actually was as long as 16 and a half months. So this really provides an early signal that the disease is coming back, which really you know, may allow your oncologist to try to catch the, the tumor at a still treatable stage. So additionally, in the post-surgical period, when the decision about who to give or not to give chemotherapy to, or you know, the intensity of the chemotherapy that should be offered, you know, Sigmatera can be very helpful. I think as um, you may be familiar, but depending on the on the type and the stage of colon cancer, uh, the decision uh, frequently is if to give chemotherapy or not to give chemotherapy, and if to give chemotherapy for a short course, for example, for three months, or for a longer course, uh, for example, for six months. You know, currently these decisions are really made uh, uh, based on a few factors uh, that we've discussed. For example, you know, how big the tumor is, if it's in the lymph nodes, how does it look under a microscope? But really, we believe that ctDNA, uh, based on this data can be another uh, factor that can be considered to make um, uh, this decision. So how do we currently use, or how do physicians use uh, Sigma Terra to help uh, inform adjuvant treatment decisions? So again, this does not replace traditional methods uh, for helping inform adjuvant treatment decisions, but it really adds another piece of information that can be used um, in this setting. So for example, for patients who are CT positive after surgery, you know the risk of recurrence is really high, close to 100%, unless the patient receives additional therapy. So this knowledge can be very helpful for the oncologist, um, who may be kind of on the fence if to offer chemotherapy or not, um, and really push uh, the, the treating oncologist in, in the direction to actually provide additional therapy. While patients who are CTA negative, again, as we've shown, are really at a much lower risk of a recurrence. So for, again, the scenario where the decision of to give adjuvant or not is already borderline, it can be also very helpful for this information to kind of push the decision one way or another. In the surveillance setting, so again, this is uh, now monitoring for when the uh, tumor is coming back or not coming back, you know, Sigma Terra can really be helpful for uh, two um, um, uh, scenarios. The first is in patients who are CTA positive, again, that really suggests that there is cancer somewhere in the body even if you may not be able to see it with traditional methods. Um, so again, this can either then lead to more frequent monitoring uh, to see when the disease actually comes back. It can also be used for, um, uh, for example, escalating imaging. 
So for example, if a patient has a positive signal tear result, but it maybe has a, just a tiny little lesion that was being followed, um, you know, this may allow the oncologist to order a more sensitive um, imaging test, like an MRI or a PET scan, to really kind of pinpoint where the cancer may be uh, located to, again, hopefully get patients to uh, a curative procedure uh, sooner. And alternatively, patients who are CTDNA negative, again, that's going to be the majority of patients. You know, this is really, again, I think a reassuring finding that most likely than not, there is no cancer that's at least uh, generating CTDNA at that time. And again, this may be very helpful, especially if, for example, there's uncertain imaging findings, um, or for example, if there is things like elevated CA, which are hard to interpret clinically. So how should the test be ordered? Well, again, we're doing multiple studies to kind of optimize the schedule of the, uh, of the testing. Um, but as we have studied it so far in our clinical trials, uh, we really recommend uh, doing a set of tests uh, because again, this is a test that can be repeated to really increase uh, the power of the test to detect uh, this circulating tumor DNA. So in the post-surgical setting, what we call the MRD or adjuvant period, we really recommend up to four tests uh, to really assess if a patient's MRD positive or negative, uh, including an, really the first oncologist visit, which usually occurs around a month after surgery. Um, and then um, a month later, usually right before adjuvant therapy started, and then really twice more during adjuvant therapy to really track the status of disease uh, during treatment. In the surveillance setting, we really recommend using the test just like you would, for example, uh, CEA, which is a common biomarker order for patients with colorectal cancer, where we would recommend testing every three months for the first uh, two years, and then really every six months uh, for an additional three years, up to five years of follow-up. So how does the test result look? Well, again, you know, I think we really try to uh, keep things simple. You know, on our reports, we say if we detect ctDNA, yes or no, and then we provide a quantity of ctDNA that's detected that can, again, be tracked over time. You know, this is something you can monitor over time and actually see how this tumor DNA, for example, changes in response to therapy, which, again, could be another marker that oncologists can help follow uh, to better really understand somebody's uh, status of their disease. So I, I think with this, I'll turn it over to uh, Sarah to introduce our next speaker. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Elishan. You know, again, I, the, we got so many questions following the town hall uh, about Cygnus Terra and just how to have conversations with uh, your doctor if he or she hasn't presented Cygnus Terra to you as an option. So we thought when we came back to do this, we would uh, ask a doctor who is using Cygnus Terra regularly in clinical practice uh, to help us understand how he brings up the assay uh, to his patients and how they have that conversation. So Dr. Bada, thank you for joining us. Um, as Dr. Allison gave us kind of a brief but comprehensive review of the data leading to people's you know, decision to use Signatera in practice, I do have a few questions for you maybe even before we get into how you particularly use it. So because a lot of our audience are patients either newly diagnosed, um, who would be listening to this with one kind of set of ears, and then patients who are already in surveillance who may be looking or maybe being followed through traditional CEA and other you know, imaging uh, studies, Let's maybe talk about the timeline for this disease. So you get a patient comes in diagnosed with stage two or three colorectal cancer. Walk us through then what happens from surgery to medical oncology uh, and how you manage that patient. Sure, absolutely, yes. For most patients who come in with a diagnosis of colon cancer to the medical oncologist, they've already seen a variety of healthcare workers. Uh, usually the presiding symptom is either blood per rectum, um, a screening colonoscopy based on age or possibly based on family history. At that point, after the patient has had a colonoscopy that evaluates the whole colon, um, they usually have a biopsy done at that time. And that biopsy will show an invasive cancer. 
Patients usually then have uh, imaging done, a CT, chest, abdomen, and pelvis to verify the lymph node status uh, in the abdomen, but also verify there isn't distant disease, whether that is in the liver or lung. At that time, the standard approach for most centers in the United States is surgery up front. Surgery up front has a variety of positive outcomes in the fact that we can evaluate the surgical removal of the tissue and determine if there are any high risk features there. Um, it also gives us a complete staging of the patient so we can make our recommendations for chemotherapies. There are rare instances where neoadjuvant chemotherapy is used, but we'll focus strictly on the standard care at this point. Um, those patients then will come see their medical oncologist uh, with their scans completed, their surgery completed, and their final pathology. Some places in the country, larger centers, they may actually even meet with their medical oncologist prior to their surgical operation. After that time, um, it is the determination of the medical oncologist as to what adjuvant or after surgery uh, therapy that the patient may need. And that's really where it comes down to these uh, gray areas. And by gray areas, I mean stage two patients and stage three patients, and then their risk stratification. And by that, I mean, do they have a high risk of this disease either remaining in their body, um, something like micrometastases? Do they have a high risk of this recurring later on at a period of time? And I think that this is the crux of where the Signatera test uh, imaging, active surveillance, and biomarkers all come into play. So, you know, we'll get the benefit of uh, hearing from Manju George from Colontown uh, just after you, and we'll kind of go into a Q&A with um, everybody on the call. But so at this time now, you know, I've gone, I've had my surgery, I've come in. Is it usually within a month that I come to see you after my surgery? And then how do you introduce the idea of um, testing or introducing me to testing that will help me monitor the stages of my disease. Absolutely, yes. Most of the patients are coming in within a, a month period. Most of the studies st suggest that you initiate adjuvant therapy around an eight-week window from your surgical operation. Those patients then will come and based on their staging, we have a conversation. Some patients are very clear-cut. If you're a stage two patient with a very low-risk disease, um, you may opt for the fact that you would look, prefer observation, and, and that could be appropriate. Uh, the other recommendation would be maybe an oral pill, something like capcitabine for six months. The other end of the spectrum of the patients with uh, high-risk disease or multiple lymph nodes involved, maybe the stage 3B or 3C patient that has uh, maybe an N2 disease or a T4 disease, meaning that they have multiple lymph nodes involved or their tumor invades through their colon actually, and maybe even touches against another organ. In the middle is the, is the gray zone where we spend actually a lot of our time discussing with our patients the risks and benefits. And the truth of the matter is, is that a lot of times uh, there are probably a lot of stage 3A patients or T3N1 or T2N1 patients that are probably overtreated. And there are probably some high risk stage 2 patients that are undertreated where they have um, either a perineural invasion or lymphovascular invasion, or their, their tumor was large and perforated or, or opened up a hole within their bowel. So these are the conversations we have and try to give them the best idea about the data we have um, and the tests that we have to determine where they fall with risk. So adding a Signatera to what you do currently standard of care, the CEA, the standard imaging, really just gives you a more specific or sensitive roadmap to be able to make those shared decisions, you know, including are you going to, are you going to, you know, go a more aggressive route? Are you going to be more conservative? So when you're talking to patients about that, are they very aware of where they fall in that spectrum when you were talking about, you know, there's one, one area, another area in this gray zone? Uh, a lot of patients come to us are very sophisticated and have that information uh, ready to go and, and are actually discussing with me the trials that, that are derived from that information and, and really want to get into the crux of the percentages. Um, another group of patients need to be educated at that time. And of course, it's always a shared decision making 
uh, session that we have with the patient. We also usually backtrack from a broader sp perspective of, of what are their goals for their care? Uh, where do they see themselves over their lifetime going? Where is it their current age? What is their current comorbidities or other medical issues going on? Um, are there safety issues that we need to take into place? Um, there are specific studies where they look at age of patients and whether or not the addition of combination chemotherapy assists or does not. So all of these come into play with the discussion of every patient that comes into the office. Um, with that discussion, we basically lay out the tools that we have available to us. Uh, we have our pathology report, our imaging report, our CEA level, or blood biomarker, both before and after surgery, as well as all of our studies that we have available that determine risk based on these stages. There's also evidence to suggest overall survival with just watching or observation or active surveillance. With the Signatera result now, um, we increase the sensitivity of that prognostic data, and we're determining also the idea of how will this assist in reducing disease with treatment and without treatment? And that's where clinical trials come into play as well. With the more sensitive test, as we discussed earlier, the CEA is only about 60 or 70% sensitive and specific, meaning that about 60 to 70% of the time it tells us the truth and about 30 to 40% of the time it lies to us. Mm -hmm. And those are the groups of patients where if you have a little more um, information, it may assist them in uh, coming to a decision and, and helping the oncologist come to a decision. Um, we always state that we're going to base our clinical judgment of therapy on all of the factors, not one of the factors. And I think that that's very important for patients to understand Many of them come in and say, well, I know I have this pathology or this EA or this risk, but we'll just base it on the test result and go from there. And we try to re-educate them, telling them that it's a whole picture. Um, we're not just picking out small pieces um, and cherry picking the positive data. We need to look at the whole picture and discuss the whole patient. So I think that those are specific issues that every oncologist could bring up with their patient. This is a tool um, added to our toolbox um, it's something that enables us to make better clinical decisions um, and that it assists patients in also understanding more information um, based on cutting edge personalized care. And, and that's where everything's going these days. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity to talk to a number of doctors uh, who are learning about Signatera, who have already incorporated it into practice, um, who are participating on the Natera um, bespoke clinical trial study uh, that, they, that they've got open that they'll use to kind of track over time um, results. One question, and I hate to put you on the spot, but I think it's a really important question that I get from a lot of um, you know, providers, physicians, is so if you've committed to adding Signatera to your toolkit, and you come to a point where you know your patient is now in surveillance, perhaps they're they're finished their first six months of treatment, they're in surveillance, and all of a sudden, you know, you're got, you're down the road a year and you get a Signatera positive. You don't have a correlative image saying there's something bad. What do you do with that test result and how do you share the information with your patient? Well, I'll actually just give you an example of a patient that I had recently. So we had a patient who was a high risk stage two patient. He was about 72 years of age. He completed his capsidabine for six months. We were in that active surveillance window, had yet to get any repeat imaging. And I um, pulled a, a Signatera CTDNA on him that came back positive. We ended up imaging him and he actually had a liver mass um, that he had available uh, within that, that imaging that we evaluated. Um, with that liver mass, we discussed, you know, what this could mean. Obviously, our biggest concern was that this was a metastatic nodule. And uh, we actually brought him to tumor board and ultimately discussed it, uh, liver-directed therapies. So we were able to target those specific areas in the liver um, and evaluate him on an ongoing basis for the need for additional treatment or not. We're considering at this point, is that the only focus of disease that he's metastasized to, or does he have additional areas as well? Um, that's, that's left up to consideration. But I think at the end of the day, um, the test can provide you with an quote unquote early warning system um, where you may not have had an image yet uh, completed on a patient or even maybe suspected that you have one in about six months and uh, you have a test come back positive 
it will initiate a chain reaction of let's do our due diligence and look around and see if we see anything. Maybe that one year follow up colonoscopy, we need to move that up a little bit sooner. Uh, maybe that imaging that we were going to wait for six months, now let's get it at four. These types of things come into the picture when you have another data um, set like that from Signaterra, where it enables you to be able to fine tune possibly your, your surveillance strategy. So you definitely shouldn't look at this as, you know, something where genomics is much more advanced than our ability to catch up uh, either with imaging or treatment decision making. No matter what, more information uh, is always helpful information in cancer, at least for the fact that you can become more aggressive in um, kind of having that flag and then searching for something uh, that, that correlates. I'll, I'll, I'll go a step further and say well-validated more information is always better to have uh, in these situations. Very true. Um, okay, well, I'd like to introduce um, Manju George to the conversation. You know, let's kind of keep it rolling in terms of patient um, and physician. So, Manju, you know, not only are you scientific director for Colon Town, one of probably the most robust patient advocacy organizations uh, in colon cancer, but you're, you yourself are um, a patient who not only knows about this information from your scientific background, but talk to us about how you came to know Signaterra for your own personal uh, disease story. Okay. Um, so I'll start from when I learned about liquid biopsies. So um, I was diagnosed in 2017 and I joined Colon Town like, uh, with stage 3B rectal cancer. And I joined Colon Town like a few days later. And I first um, started seeing some posts about liquid biopsies and so I was interested and I started reading up on it um, and I was really hooked <laughs> and um, this was important to me because at my diagnosis my CEA was one I mean it was you know normal so and um, I was interested in having a marker that can be used um, to follow you know after I finish my treatments um, so I, I was um, really interested in reading about liquid biopsies so I was watching all these you know looking at all the journal articles that, that were coming up. And then I kind of took it on myself to actually post to the group about liquid biopsies. So I started posting, you know, anything, review articles, journal articles, videos, anything that I could find on the internet, I would post and, you know, kind of start a discussion. So I, um, so those days people were talking about, you know, non-tumor informed kind of liquid biopsies like Garden 360 and, you know, people were all having it and, um, you know, um, I also got one done for me and um, it was negative and that was good. Um, but, you know, I was kind of, um, I had an older kind of test done at diagnosis. Uh, it was called an um, Oncotype DX. And then there was another one, which is a, um, which was a, um, what was it called? It was some kind of chromosomal markers and looking at all of those. And um, that study kind of showed that like, I didn't have any mutations when they, they looked up at about 300 mutations. So then I was worried that um, the non-tumor informed uh, liquid biopsies, you know, maybe just wouldn't be so good for me. And then last year I um, heard about Signaterra first from Dr. Kasi and we met at the meeting and they were talking about it and they were like, um, you know, Signaterra is better for surveillance uh, for minimal residual disease. And then like next month um, I was at great debates in Chicago and then Dr. Kopetz gave a talk about minimal residual disease and he also brought up Signaterra. So that kind of like, I was like, what is this test? Um, so I kind of Googled it and um, found an email and then kind of emailed them saying that I'm this patient, you know, my, uh, my CA is really low and I'm really looking for something that would help with surveillance. And I had about 10 questions um, covering different aspects and I said, um, based on the information that I get, I plan to post this in Colon Town because it'd be useful to a lot of patients. And within about like three or four days, two or three different people put in different parts of, you know, all the questions that I asked, and I actually got a very, very detailed response. So I posted that in Colon Town, and then uh, a lot of people got interested, and then um, they were all, you know, from different parts of the country. Um, they post saying that um, I had my first signature test, uh, my, it was my oncologist's first, I was my oncologist's first patient. And I had gone back to my oncologist um, who I was seeing during the time I was getting treated. And um, she was not a fan of um, liquid biopsy. She thought that it was too early. And um, 
she, um, she, she said that it's probably not the time yet to use it in clinical practice. That was her opinion. So I'm, um, this year I'm like, the, it's my third year um, since my diagnosis. So I was really keen on doing it. And then I actually um, switched to another oncologist and I actually contacted her saying that I'm really keen on doing the test. And um, that's how, I mean, I actually got the test done. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. Well, Manju, you know, it's so interesting because you do see the spectrum, you know, just as Dr. Bada was saying about disease, you do see the spectrum in terms of the empowered patient. And we've been doing so many um, town halls and interviews with different levels of patient advocate leaders who also say, you know, there are these really informed patients that kind of dig in don't stop until they get all the information they need all the way to the other side of the spectrum where they you know don't really know anything about their diagnosis their disease they go in they speak with their doctor and they just kind of are a recipient of information but they're not necessarily seeking information outside of that so it's very interesting um your story before i ask you a few more questions dr allison you know um Manju started talking about liquid biopsies and you know, you started your presentation saying this tumor-informed approach. Why was it difficult and, you know, why is it different uh, now that Signatera uses it? Another question we get a lot is, you know, is that, are these mutations that are found, are these variants that are found, things that would be found on comprehensive genomic profiling? If you could just take a, just a couple minutes to level set the audience to say, what are screening tests? What are surveillance tests? And then what are like targeted therapy tests so that we all have a picture of what it is we're talking about? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Sarah. So at a very high level, uh, there are two types of tests. Uh, one type of liquid biopsy tests really looks for actionable mutations uh, to help inform a therapeutic treatment decision. So for example, finding a certain mutation that may have a therapy that can be prescribed if that mutation is present. Most of these methods are actually done with a tumor uninformed approach or a tumor naive approach. And actually that's beneficial for that type of test because sometimes the tumor mutations are heterogeneous uh, and a portion of the tumor that you biopsy may miss that particular mutation or you can maybe not even get a biopsy because of the location of the tumor. So there, a tumor uninformed approach makes a lot of sense to basically see what's in the plasma to identify something that may be targetable. We actually focus on a very different question. We really focus on the question, is there a tumor present or not? And here you actually wanna be super laser focused. You wanna be looking for the right mutations, mutations that occur very early in the tumor's evolution because those are really the good biomarkers uh, that allow you to find this you know, proverbial needle in the haystack, these low, low, low levels of CTDNA to let us really identify patients who have residual disease. We look at way more mutation than traditional um, uh, CGP um, uh, liquid biopsy tests. So most of these tests focus on you know, anywhere between you know, 70 genes and sometimes up to you know, 500 or even 600 genes we really focus on 20,000 genes. So we sequence the entire exome, the entire um, uh, DNA of a tumor that's uh, coding, as it's called. And that really gives us a much broader picture of what mutations are present and allows us to really cherry pick the best mutations uh, for our surveillance test. So I think to answer your question is, yes, we do find different mutations that could not be found with a traditional liquid biopsy approach but again, we really don't find them for therapeutic reasons. We really find them to be markers of the presence or absence of disease over time. Yeah, that's, I think that that's such a key, especially when you're thinking about, you know, as Manju talk, talked about her doctor, um, you know, taking this new technology or something that maybe he or she had not incorporated yet into clinical practice, a lot of it is because there's so much new data coming at you know, oncologists on a day-to-day -day basis, so many new technologies, so many new drugs, that really sometimes it's navigating through you know, what is actionable, what can help you, what's well-validated, Dr. Bada pointed out earlier. 
uh, and they just don't really have the bandwidth to know all of this, which is why I think programs like this are really informative, both for patients and for physicians in order to make really good um, clinical decisions. So Manju, back to your story, you know, here you are um, having gone through therapy, really being that educated patient, tapping into a patient advocacy organization, which to me just is such an invaluable uh, opportunity for patients because you really do, uh, like your founder likes to say, you really do find your people. Um, these are people that have gone through their disease at different stages, different experiences, but certainly can identify uh, with the things that you're going through. And you reach out to your doctor, you say, hey, I've heard from Pashtun Kasi uh, from University of Iowa and Scott Kopetz from MD Anderson now on this test. Um, you know, is it for me? And he or she says, no, I don't think it's for you. And you still don't leave it there. You say, well, I think it's for me because I've done my diligence. And you seek out an oncologist willing uh, to test you as well as get with the company to give you more information. So now, I mean, maybe let's kind of do it in a way, talk, take the conversation in a way that, you know, you and Dr. Bada can have an exchange in that being this informed patient and bringing this information to your oncologist, how did they then order the test for you and then sit with you to interpret the results? So in my case, um, what I did is that I um, reached out to my contact in the company, Natera, and then I had to give my doctor's name. So what they did is that they reached out to the doctor and I had already told my doctor that I was interested and the company might reach out to her. And then her main thing was that like, what if it's positive? You know, I'm three years out from diagnosis and um, if it's positive, then uh, till they see it on a scan, um, you know, she, according to guidelines, she can't treat me. And I said, that was fine. Like, um, I'm thinking the other way. What if it's negative? Then, you know, I have peace of mind, right? And I said, like, if it's positive, let's think about it then. And then um, what, what then happened is that, like, um, the company um, reached out to my oncologist. And then the company also reached out to me. And they said, they asked me whether, um, you know, they'd arrange for the tissue to be um, procured from the hospital. And that they would um, arrange for somebody either to either for me to go to the um, clinic to have blood drawn or to have somebody come to my house for um, blood being drawn. And this being the COVID times, I said like I'd prefer if somebody came home. Yeah, that was my experience. Yeah, uh, Dr. Bada, Manju was talking about you know this. She brought up this idea, this notion of patient anxiety. You know, what if the test is positive? that's what the doctor's thinking. And, you know, here's the patient thinking, yeah, but what if it's negative? You know, it's more information. So if you have a patient that kind of flips, so here you are thinking, you know, I want to be able as a physician to find, to add a tool um, to my toolkit that helps me identify an earlier trigger of something changing based on what Dr. Allison said, this, you know, vast profiling uh, of the tumor to find what specifically we're looking at that would change. What do you say to a patient who says to you, but doc, what if it's positive? I mean, what will we do? What do you say to patients who come in with anxiety? Well, I think that in these situations, it's like every piece of information we have, you know, CEA is rising. You know, every oncologist has that conversation with their patient. What does it mean? Well, you know, sometimes we don't know. Sometimes it rises for other reasons. So I think we're, we're familiar with having those conversations. Now, the benefit of the Signatera is, is if it's, if it's positive or negative, it, it's black or white. And in those situations, um, it's a matter of saying, all right, well, if it's positive, we're going to do our due diligence to validate whether or not there's disease there or not. Now, will I ever be able to prove that it is uh, there and that it's going to affect your life in any other way? I cannot. And, you know, it's just the, the honest approach with them. But what it does is it gives us an early warning sign that, hey, something might be there. Maybe we do need to move those scans up or have that colonoscopy or, or have a visit sooner or check your labs sooner. You know, those are those types of things. I think a lot of physicians get worried about that this is going to add another layer of complexity or burden to their day-to-day -day schedules, when in actuality, it, it's not. It, it's, it's basically allowing you to evaluate a patient 
um, on, a, on a different time schedule um, and maybe with, with more information uh, to be able to discuss with them. Um, you know, if patients come and, and they have anxiety about that, um, a lot of times I talk to them saying, well, it's better to have that information if it's positive so that you're able to do something about it. And if it's negative, just as you were saying, that you have a better peace of mind about that. You know, the data is validated um, in patients and, and we can show them that data. So, you know, I think at the end of the day, um, it's in a conversation that all oncologists should be able to have and, and have the skill set to have. And in a way, it does mirror the CEA conversation. I mean, you do get patients where the CEA rises, as Dr. Allison says, maybe because of something else that could add to that, oh my goodness, is my, is my cancer returning? And on further investigation, you know, it was a false positive. Uh, so, you know, I think what you're saying is that this is a conversation that you're used to having, even talking about the traditional tools that you use. Uh, well, Manju, you know, going back to kind of the patient experience, it seems to me that, you know, through both Dr. Bada's uh, discussions as well as your own with even your first oncologist before you switched, this was very much a conversation. You know, it was, this is a new technology. Uh, this is new information. Let's take a look at the data. Let's talk about how it might apply to my specific disease. And then the shared part of the conversation really is, you know, what do we do if, what do we do when, mm -hmm. um, based on like what Dr. Bada was saying, sometimes it's really even the patient's treatment goals. You know, you don't nearly always reflex to something because you've got to consider, you know, is it an 85 year old patient that just says, this is what I want to do? Or is it someone like you with, you know, a beautiful young child at home that has very different uh, objectives for your therapy. So do, did you feel or have you felt that that's been your experience even with some of the people in Colon Town as they've been introducing this, mm -hmm. that it is very much of a conversation? Yes, yes. So in my case, um, when I was diagnosed um, and I was ready for chemo, um, I was set to have like 12 cycles of Farfox, but it was that week in 2017 that the idea study results came out and they said that, you know, four cycles of K-Pox is good enough. Yeah. So I went to the doctor and I was like, I don't want two cycles of fall pox. Can I have like three months of chemo? And she said, why, you know, why don't you think about K-Pox? And then she told me this, you know, the HFS and the other um, side effects due to the higher oxaliplatin concentration. And she sent me home and said, why don't you think about it? Come back next week and then you can decide whether you want 12 cycles of Farfox or, you know, four cycles of K-Pox. So I actually chose um, four cycles of K-Pox. And <clears throat> mine is, a, um, I had an upper rectal tumor, so I did not have chemo radiation. So those were the reasons why um, especially with my CA being so low, I wanted to have another way of knowing whether the tumor, you know, what are the chances of the tumor coming back. Um, in Colon Town, we find that like um, a lot of people um, try to go to their doctors and they have this conversation. And usually, you know, like um, what I've found is that even with Signature being new, like um, I have all these posts and uh, they'll come back and say, I talked to my doctor about Signature and they were like, you know, I had to provide the information. But the best thing is that um, I found that a lot of oncologists are very receptive and they ask, where do you get the information? And I have some papers or something, and then I send it to them. And um, they take that to their doctor and the doctor is really interested in finding out, you know, like, um, how is this? And they're ready to call the company and get more information. So what I feel is that um, in Colon Town, while we try to, you know, <laughs> actually we try a lot to make this test popular, um, it's really helping because, um, from the patient side, we are actually able to, um, you know, uh, I, I won't call it educate, but inform the doctors about the possibility of these tests. And, uh, you know, they are on their part, like many places when um, a member of Colin Town was the first person to have the test, then that doctor is now using the test to, for, in other patients. So, you know, like I feel that by doing this, um, we are also on our part being able to help this new thing get, become more widespread. Yes, yes. You know, when you think about all the new drugs and diagnostics, the technologies that are coming available, you know, we're coming up to a large oncology meeting this weekend that'll un hopefully uncover, I know looking at the abstract list, we'll uncover all these exciting things in various tumor types. 
you know, there is so much information and especially if you're being treated in the community where your doctor mm -hmm. isn't focused, like, you know, Dr. Bada is very focused on uh, one tumor type, the community physicians really see all comers. And mm -hmm. so, you know, their, their patient day might look like newly diagnosed breast cancer, metastatic lung cancer, hematology cases coming in, um, patients that, you know, they put on Herceptin years and years ago, so it's like this run of, of uh, the whole spectrum in terms of, of uh, patients that they're seeing. And there is so much data being developed every day that it's very challenging to you know, always be up to date with everything. So mm -hmm. I do find it so valuable that patient advocacy groups try to keep themselves appraised of you know, things that really matter uh, to patient care and that you know, academic thought leaders like Dr. Bada, Dr. Kazi, Dr. Kopetz, um, really do their best to kind of spread the information from podium and from areas where they know that, especially community doctors uh, tap into. Dr. Allison, as we round out this um, informational program, I do wanna ask you just a few practical questions about uh, Signatera. The first being, if you are a doctor in the community, um, never heard of this, you have a patient either that comes up and talks to you about it, or, you know, you read something on a headline from the ASCO news, um, or you saw a video uh, by one of the educational companies. How should they go about getting more information uh, about Signatera? Well, I think our website um, that you can access just by either Googling Signatera or going to Natera.com and then clicking through to the Signatera section is a great start. You know, I think it summarizes the published data in a kind of a quick uh, to digest format. But we always also encourage uh, oncologists to, to really dive deeper. You know, I think the strength of the test is the large amount of published data. Uh, and it's not just in colorectal cancer and other cancer types as well. Um, all of those links are available on our website uh, to that published literature. And if even then there's still more questions kind of reaching out uh, through our website, um, you know, we have a team of uh, dedicated uh, uh, Metafera specialists who can even uh, uh, reach out to you and go through the data in even more detail. So we really kind of encourage that route to, to get a little bit more information about the test. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talked about this being kind of a follow-up to this colorectal cancer care in the time of COVID. And even as we're all transitioning at different times, different states and hospital systems, you know, opening up uh, differently with the various phases that they're in. I know that Natera, uh, through the Signatera program, developed kind of an expanded access program. Maybe you can speak a little bit to, you know, what this means for the doctor in clinical practice. So, you know, obviously in, in colorectal cancer, uh, the test is, is, is being, you know, more and more widely adopted. Um, in other GI malignancies, you know, I think the data is still evolving, though a lot of the early data also suggests that Signatera uh, can be used in a very similar fashion to the way it is in, in colorectal cancer. And the test is validated um, in all solid tumors uh, for clinical use. So really to kind of, again, facilitate um, the ability to offer uh, monitoring to patients you know, during these difficult times of COVID, we have um, opened up um, access to the test beyond just the core CRC indication to include other GI malignancies where the oncologist thinks um, having this type of information can be helpful. And what we're really hearing from some of our providers is that they really find the ability to test patients uh, for presence or absence of CTA, very helpful, especially if uh, patients are unable to get routine imaging studies, for example, because CT scans are being used to help treat COVID patients. Uh, patients are unable to get to the hospital uh, because either distance or risk for uh, infection. Uh, so again, this provides another tool that can be deployed remotely uh, through our mobile phlebotomy service where um, somebody can actually show up and in a, in a, in a mask um, um, and really be able to draw sterile blood at a patient's home without having the patient travel to possibly a high risk setting like a hospital. Uh, so again, it, it is a tool we're offering uh, during this difficult period 
for patients uh, diagnosed with any GI malignancy uh, mm -hmm. and not just colorectal cancer. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Bada, um, you know, this is particularly important, especially as we're starting to see um, data released on just how many screening visits have been missed in these last two months while we've kind of all been quarantined. You know, there seems to be a feeling that uh, we're going to have this wave, but it won't necessarily be a wave of COVID-19. It'll be a wave uh, in oncology, you know, progressive disease and things like that, that or maybe new diagnoses that are, are diagnosed later uh, that have completely different outcomes uh, associated because of the delay. So, you know, do you agree that accessing or using Signatera, even, you know, as part of the toolkit, but during these times, could be helpful to practice? Oh, absolutely. You know, I think any tool that you can use to um, evaluate the patient from afar is beneficial. And, and just as we had discussed, mobile, mobile phlebotomy um, really provides us a benefit to be able to go to the patient's home and, and maybe draw them on their front porch or, or even inside their doorway. And the idea is, is that that's more information than I had, you know, 20 minutes before that test. So I think, you know, at the end of the day, um, getting that information only gives us a better idea of where a patient stands and uh, where their disease is. And then it allows us to create a, a risk benefit ratio. You know, if you say, hey, it appears that you're now high risk, whereas before you were not, you know, the benefits of coming into the center are, are higher now than maybe they were before. And again, you know, uh, this is a discussion you have with your patients and you allow them to assess the risk based on, on, their, on their goals you know, um, and, and you allow them to have the information and educate them as best they can. But at the end of the day, give them the info so that they can make the best decision for themselves and their family. But at the end of the day, most patients want to have more information about their, about their uh, case and their care, just as we all would. So I think that these, these types of screening um, from afar are, are very beneficial for everyone involved. You know, it, it definitely helps me out with some of my patients I'm worrying about, to, you know, and they can't get in or they're not getting scanned. And and we're able to, to get out to their home, you know, they appreciate being thought of uh, during this time and that their case still matters. And even perhaps, you know, I've heard that as we transition back into kind of our standard or whatever new normal will look like, some of the takeaways from being able to do follow-up visits through telemedical portals, et cetera, where you don't have to kind of bring patients back in on a, on a regular, you know, with a regular environment, even in the absence of COVID-19, we may find that some of these things stick, that you could you know, perhaps continue to offer kind of remote surveillance in order to help um, uh, guide the, the conversation uh, coming in. Well, Mandrew, I'm gonna end with you because I always feel like you know, the patient's voice should be the loudest voice in the room. Uh, you know, I find so much that I'm inspired by the way that you know, patients lift each other up through it, through hard times, you know, hard times don't only mean COVID-19, it means the diagnosis of a, of a cancer, um, which, you know, kind of stops you in your tracks. Uh, I'm so happy that you shared your story. And what I want to do is give you the opportunity to kind of just share one takeaway about empowering yourself with information. You know, how do you encourage others or how would you encourage others to empower themselves with information and with the courage to have this conversation with their doctors. So um, I, as we were having the discussion, um, I kind of wanted to say this, that um, for many patients, like Dr. Varda mentioned, like what if the test is positive? And, you know, let's say you don't see anything on the scan because, um, uh, you know, it takes that much time, right? Like eight months to 16 months before it shows, um, you know, um, so, when we were having this discussion in Colton Town, the thing was that like, uh, let's say it's a stage three patient and you had whatever, you know, three months or six months of chemo and you have an understanding of what it means, right? Like, you know, what the experience is like. So knowing upfront that, you know, you have a positive test, but you still don't see anything on the CT scan, you can prepare yourself. You can decide that, you know, you want to take that vacation. You want to go meet your family who's across the country, or you want to do something that you, you know, climb a mountain, like whatever. You, you can plan that and do that. And then you know that, you know, maybe in the next five months, maybe you'll see something on the scan and then you'll have to start treatment. So even um, when you have that information and you, you know, you don't, 
you are in a situation where you can't start treatment that knowing is important for the patient. Yeah. I yeah. kind of want to say that. And um, as far as um, empowering patients, like um, by providing this information about Signaterra, like, um, you know, we have so many cases where, um, you know, somebody was stage two and um, they had all 12 cycles of Paul Fox and now they have severe neuropathy and they're like 35 years old. You know, things like that. So it's important now that we tell them, if you're stage two, you know, you don't have to get 12 cycles of chemo. You can have this test done. And if it's negative, then maybe you can go discuss with your doctor and, you know, think of all the other risk factors you, that you have. And then maybe you have only like four cycles of K-Pox. You know, that for a 35-year-old, um, you know, life without neuropathy is like a big deal, right? And for other people, like we have so many people who come back and say that, you know, um, they are now one year after the end of chemo and they had a scan and there is a shadow on their scan in their lungs and um, they're so anxious about it and, you know, they're not sure what's going to happen. Their CA is still normal um, and they can't sleep and they're anxious because, you know, it brings back memories of, you know, facing cancer once again. So in those situations too, uh, having a test like this, you know, you have a positive test, you know that you know, it's back, like that shadow is not nothing but you have a negative test, then you know that maybe, you know, it's maybe some inflammation or something else. So um, in that respect too, um, knowing that such a test is available um, is really helpful. And then in our groups, you find that about 30% of people, for them, CA is not at all useful. We have stage four patients with METs in the liver and lungs with CA 0.6. You know, those people like when they're on, um, so for, um, stage three or stage three patients who have a CEA of 0.7 uh, and they're getting all their screenings and, you know, the CEA is still <laughs> 0.6 or 0.7 and they're so worried, you know, uh, like, when is it coming back? Are they going to find one scan full of like something growing, you know? Um, so in those situations too, getting signature brings, uh, gives them so much peace of mind, you know, and like Dr. Bata said, everybody, like most of the patients who are in Colon Town, they'd rather know that they have something growing um, earlier than later. So. Yeah, and it is, it's credible information. It's information that adds to another set of pictures yeah. that you've gotten from other things. Um, and it's definitely information that kind of puts the whole team, including you. I learned from a patient advocate from a, a kidney cancer program that I did where she kind of said this big capital Y-O-U. You are the most important person on your healthcare team. And I think that that really is a takeaway uh, that patients and physicians uh, can have that, you know, at the end of the day, if you have a Manju George that's coming in saying, I've heard of this test and, you know, this is the data behind it and I really want it and I really want it and I really want it. Sometimes you have to kind of say, she's the most important person on her healthcare team. So if she wants it, you know, let's kind of explore, make sure that it's right for her disease and then let's you know give it a shot with all the caveats of you know what happens if it's positive what happens all those other questions so i think it really you know it circles back around to information is power credible information is power uh, validated information is power and we are as a cancer community evolving at such a rapid pace um, that personalized medicine is here it's no longer something in the future it's here and in order to treat a patient, you know, using their specific tumor biology uh, to make decisions that, like you say, Manju, and I think it's so beautiful, you say can help them make decisions on whether or not they go climb that mountain. I think that that's so powerful to give someone uh, the reassurance that a test like this added to other things that you use as standards can help give you that, that specific and sensitive information. Well, I thank all three of you for joining me. You know, I really, I had such a good time with the bigger group as we talked about advocacy, um, you know, what all the doctors are doing at this crazy time of COVID and then hearing from uh, Dr. Allison, just kind of a little teaser of Signatera. I'm so glad that we got to dive deeper. Uh, there will be more information about Signatera after ASCO, uh, which is next week. This is our major cancer meeting. So stay tuned for, you know, better, more deeper information and application. Visit that website, uh, natera.com. Visit Colon Town. Uh, get to know how to get involved in the Colon Town communities. It is an invaluable resource. Uh, and they also point you to other advocacy organizations. 
and be open to talking with your doctors. You know, I know Dr. Bada is ahead of the curve, especially uh, as a national thought leader in this space. But, you know, doctors are there to be part of your team. So feel free to kind of introduce information to them and get them all of the tools that they need to themselves dive deeper. Because I do think it doesn't only benefit you as a patient, um, but it really benefits the community of, of patients that the doctor will then be educated uh, on the various technologies about. So I thank all three of you for joining me for this. And I look forward um, to doing more of these with you to continue to educate the patient community as the data evolves. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you.